morning, everyone. Good morning. I think we're kind of low energy here. Too much turkey in the last few days. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to be here in worship with you. Few announcements. First of all, there is no paper announcement bulletin this morning. Of course, on the holiday week, we had problems printing and couldn't get anyone out here in time. But you can check out the announcements on the website, on the bulletin, under the worship section. Then secondly, if you can come back uh, after the 11 o'clock service today, we're going to be decorating the sanctuary and the fellowship hall. So it's always a fun time, and you're welcome to join us. Next week is the beginning of Advent, and we will have one worship service at 11, no 8.30 service, and this is our big uh, kickoff to the Advent Christmas season. It's, uh, what is it called again? The Story of Christmas in Word and Song. And this is where we hear from most of our music groups in the church. McCready Road will be there, the Chancel Choir, uh, and two of our bell choirs. So it's really a fun time. It's a wonderful worship experience. Please come and then join us for the reception afterwards. Next week, there are new discovery classes that are beginning, and I'll let you check those out on our website. And then also, the thing that's beginning is the Deacon's Angel Tree, and this is where we are able to provide gifts for children in our own congregation as well as in our community. So there's lots going on, and I hope you'll check out what, see, what is appearing on our website to see where you can fit in and be a part of it. So now, friends, let's come before the Lord in worship and praise. Christ Jesus has been enthroned above all authority and power in this world and in the world that is to come. God has placed everything under Christ's feet, appointed the one who wore a crown of thorns as the supreme head of the church. As Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise, and give thanks and praise to his loving name. So let's sing. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were
Amen. Please be seated. So today, churches all across the world worship the reign and the majesty of Christ our King. We recognize, however, that we often fall short of living a Christ-like life. So let us confess together. Father, we are here today with regrets of living lives that are not obedient to your will. We've, we put ourselves first and act to protect what we think is ours. We often fail to respond to the needs of others and don't take the opportunity to act as Christ acted. We're too willing to compromise ourselves instead of holding on to what we know is true. We ask for your forgiveness and your restoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 86 says, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Amen. Amen. As Jason said, this is Christ the King Sunday. In the church calendar, it is the Sunday before Advent, the Sunday that we remember and celebrate Jesus Christ, not only as Savior and Lord, but as King of Kings. And so the first scripture reading is Psalm 93, which really celebrates the Lord is King. The Lord is King. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. More majestic than the thunders of mighty waters. More majestic than the waters of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. And then the New Testament reading is from Matthew 5, verses 17 to 20. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. At the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry, he announced the kingdom of heaven is here. And that means much, much more than just a new king has arrived and he's going to be taking charge from now on. Because the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, means a new reality dawned for God's creation. That means that nothing is the same. Nothing is the same how we relate to God, how we relate to other people, how we live our lives, how we speak, think, act, our priorities, our principles, everything gets turned around. And the early Christians really understood this because remember, they freely gave away their goods. They were not concerned with acquiring things and keeping things for themselves. They were out there sharing with the poor. And they lived with an immediate awareness of the fact that God's kingdom was all around them and in them. But as time went on, the church became organized, institutionalized, and so Christians lost that vital awareness of God's kingdom. And the church, throughout its history, wherever it was in different places at different times, Christians would take on the values of the surrounding cultures. And that certainly is true for us today. I've said before 
that in order to live as a New Testament Christian, it really means we have to be countercultural. Well, there's a British pastor named Leonard Ravenhill, and he went even further than that. He said, Christianity today is so subnormal that if any Christian began to act like a normal New Testament Christian, he would be considered abnormal. And isn't that true? If someone tried to live like a real New Testament Christian, giving away all that they had, sharing everything with the poor, we would consider them abnormal, eccentric, fanatically religious, because our cultural values drive us to be very moderate in our expressions of faith. And I think that's particularly true for us in the Reformed Presbyterian tradition. There's a reason why people call us God's frozen chosen. But we're influenced by our culture in a lot more ways than we really realize. Anthropologist Edward Hall developed a theory of culture back in the 1970s, and it's the iceberg theory of culture. Have you heard of that, the iceberg theory? Well, you know, an iceberg, you can only see 10% of it above the surface of the water. 90% of the iceberg is under the surface. And the same thing is true of culture. We can only see about 10% of it. It includes things like food and music and art and literature. But to really understand a culture, you've got to go below the surface to examine the unspoken rules like nonverbal communication, the acceptable way to deal with emotions, concepts of personal space, and ideas about appropriate behavior. And then even deeper than that are a culture's core values. And these are learned ideas about what is good and bad, what is right and not right, acceptable and unacceptable. And so a lot of what is under the surface in our culture, it, there are things that we're not even aware of. They're not even a part of our consciousness. We just respond according to these core values, and we make assumptions based on these core values. So what does it mean for a Christian to be countercultural? It means that we have to look at our own cultural values and see what matches up with God's kingdom values and what does not. And then, of course, work with the Holy Spirit in that lifelong transformation process so that our values really become God's values or yeah, we align ourselves with God's values. And one of the foundational changes that needs to happen for us as Christians is that instead of saying, what do I want to get out of God? We say instead, how can I more and more completely submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? To totally different perspectives. God's kingdom values are what we want to adopt, about what we want to align ourselves with. And a mark of true transformation by the Holy Spirit is when we wholeheartedly embrace obedience to God for the things that he wants us to do, the ways he wants us to live. But what you often see are people that um, water down the call to obey God, explaining away the things that are required of us. Back in 2013, Billy Graham was interviewed, and he said, it's really not surprising if people believe easily in a God who makes no demands. But this is not the God of the Bible. Satan has cleverly misled people by whispering that they can believe in Jesus Christ without being changed. If there is no change in a person's life, 
he or she must question whether or not they possess the salvation that the gospel proclaims. Many who go to church have not had a life-changing transformation in Christ. And I think it comes down to the central issue of who is going to be the authority in your life. Is Jesus going to be the authority, or are you going to be the authority about what you should do and how you should live? Because in our culture, each person is considered to be the authority for himself or herself. So my truth is going to be different than your truth. But if we are Christians, if we're followers of Christ, then our allegiance first and foremost is to Jesus. And we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And kingdom values are very different from our culture's values and any culture on this planet. The absolute truth of Jesus Christ, who he is, goes beyond any historical or cultural limitations. And scripture teaches us that absolute truth of who Jesus is and who we are in him, and therefore what our lives are to be like, Scripture also teaches us the moral right way of living. And we come to understand that and we come to internalize it, make it our own, as we spend time in Scripture, both Old and New Testaments. Now, you know, as Reformed Christians, we don't ignore the Old Testament. In fact, throughout the history of the church, Orthodox Christianity has also always held that rejection of the Old Testament is heresy. So the Old Testament is just as important for our understanding of what God wants for us as the new. But it is important to understand the Old Testament in light of the new. And in particular, there are different types of laws in the Old Testament. So there is sacrificial law, there is moral law, for example. And so we know that in the new covenant of Jesus Christ, there is still a need for atonement. There has to be amends made for sin, but... In Jesus Christ, there is no need for the Old Testament sacrificial system because Jesus' death on the cross paid for the sins of the world. So that part of the law was perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Moral law is what we still need to pay attention to, but the thing about moral law is that we cannot live rightly in our own strength. We can't do it perfectly. Israel tried for generations. We cannot do it apart from life in Christ. And of course, remembering that salvation is not about living rightly, doing all the right things. It's about having faith in the work of Christ. That's what saves us. So the issue of the law is really what Jesus is talking about here in the Matthew passage that I read earlier. And Jesus made what would have been considered an absolutely astounding claim for his time. He said that he himself was the completion of the law and the prophets. The scripture of that time for the Jewish people was the Torah, the books of the law, and the writings of the prophets. And Jesus said that he did not come to abolish the law. His work on behalf of humanity and the creation didn't do away with the law. Really, it completely fulfilled the law. And so if you think about it, 
If we are in Christ following Jesus, who is the complete fulfillment of the law, then we are really aligned with the law. Because this passage that I read, Jesus is saying the law is still very important. So the question often is, well, what do we as Christians, New Testament Christians, what do we have to do with the law? Well, if we're following Jesus, we are aligned with the law. We're doing what God always wanted for his people. And so that means that more and more, as we grow in our faith, as we grow to become more and more like Jesus, we're going to become countercultural. We're going to take on the values of the kingdom of heaven. We're going to leave behind many of the values of 21st century United States of America culture. There'll be a separation from the world. But yet, as time goes on, it seems to me that more and more, if we're going to live as New Testament Christians, we are going to be at odds with our culture. Because our cultural values have changed over the past 40, 50 years to become very much in opposition of kingdom values. But it's not all doom and gloom. Because we have an amazing future ahead of us. And this is something that we don't hear much about in church, but is very appropriate for Christ the King Sunday. Of course, this is the Sunday that we remember and celebrate that Jesus Christ, our King, will reign forever and ever and ever. And that always reminds me of the Alleluia Chorus. When Kent and I were living in San Francisco, attending the church where we were married, that church every Christmas did a portion of Handel's Messiah. And we always did the Alleluia Chorus, the whole orchestra and choir. It was just magnificent. People looked forward to it so much throughout the year. And my favorite part of the Alleluia Chorus, in fact, I could rarely sing it without choking up, is this. The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever. Amen. And in the joyful reign of Christ, it will be a fulfillment, a completion of the reality of the kingdom of heaven. And you know what the amazing part of that is, too? We are going to reign with him. The book of Revelation tells us this in several places, as does 2 Timothy chapter 2. We will reign with Christ. It's part of our inheritance. It's part of who the Lord has made us to be. But it's not just a future reality. It also begins in this life as well. Ephesians chapter 2 says, We have been raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. That's an amazing thing. It's hard to imagine But those words, raised up, they're actually past tense. The verb is past tense, which means it's already an accomplished fact in our lives. So what does that mean for how we live today? Well, it means that there really is no need for striving to perfectionism for comparing ourselves to anyone else, we can abandon jealousy and envy. We don't have to fight to be recognized. We don't have to fight to be special or to be loved because Jesus has already accomplished that for us. We don't need to be looking to other people to make us feel better about ourselves. 
We reign with Christ, friends. It is a living, present reality of being citizens of the kingdom. So that's what it means to be a citizen of this kingdom of heaven that seems so abstract at times. It means that life on this planet is not all there is. And sometimes we need that hope, that hope of future joy and fulfillment and completion of all that God wants for us and for his creation. This is our inheritance. So let's close now with the time of prayer. Oh God, we know that you have made us to be so much more than what we can possibly imagine. You have called us to sit with you in the heavenly places. We don't even really understand what that means, but God, we know that we do not need to be ashamed of who we are, to feel that somehow we are less than others. We do not need to seek our approval from other people because you have accomplished in us this glorious inheritance, your sons and daughters who will be part of your rule and reign. Help us to live into that reality of the kingdom of heaven. Help us to take on the values of the kingdom and let go of the values of our culture that drive us. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you for this wonderful vision that you hold out before us. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and King. To him be all glory and honor and praise forever and ever. Amen. We're going to have a chance to respond to that message in song at the end of the service um, with the word, um, with the song, Because He Lives. And the bridge, I'm just going to read you the words from that. Um, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, every fear is gone. I know he holds my life, my future in his hands. So we're going to get to sing that in a little bit. But right now we're going to turn things around a little bit and um, begin to kind of prepare our hearts for this time of prayer that we're going to be having after this next song. Um, it's probably new to a lot of you, um, but it is uh, a variation of a song that you, I'm sure you all know um, called It Is Well. So the purpose of this song in this space today is just to kind of calibrate our hearts, get them in the right place, um, so that when we go into this time of prayer for healing and for wholeness and um, renewal, that we'll kind of have a frame of reference um, by singing these words or by reading the words, however you uh, wish to participate in the song, you're more than welcome. Um, but it's basically a song of saying, like, God has been there and done that. He knows. He knows everything that's came in and disrupted your life and your peace. And he knows he's not responsible for in the way of like, how could you do that, God? But he understands. He knows. He went before you. He's going behind you. He's got all sides of you. So when we are disrupted with something, we can take uh, refuge knowing that God is with us. He's allowing us to experience these things. And some of the greatest blessings in my life have came out of horrible times. You guys have walked me through some of those seasons. You've seen me. You've been by my side. And um, you've seen the outcome of that. So we're going to sing these words together or let the words wash over you however you wish. God, would you just be in this place? Prepare our hearts to hear from you um, in a real and tangible way, God, so that we thaw out. Keep thawing us out, God. We know that you have set us on the counter and we're defrosting and we pray that you just continue to wash over us um, with your warmth and love and that we would be a passionate people after your heart. Lord, put us put in perspective the pleas of our lives, the pleas of the seasons that we're in, God, put in perspective 
God, we're searching for holy gain. We're searching for your, your kingship over us.
bless you. Thank you, God, that we can say that with full confidence. Whatever it is, whatever it is, the waves and the winds in our life, God, they still know your name. We thank you, God. You are good and you are powerful and you triumph over all. Amen. Periodically, we have the opportunity in the context of worship to receive prayers. We are called to support and pray for one another in the body of Christ. Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians was that God himself, the God of peace, will sanctify you through and through in your whole spirit, soul, and body. So we pray for the wholeness of Christ in our lives. So I'm going to invite you to come to receive prayer. The prayer teams can go to their stations now. There will be two in the back and one over here on the side. We ask you to stay in your seat until the prayer team is available and then you may go up and receive prayer. If you do not wish to receive prayer today, then use this time for your own personal prayer and quiet time with the Lord. Heavenly Father, we lift up thanks and praise for the abundance of blessings you bestow on us each and every day. Those things that we so often take for granted because they're so much a part of our everyday routine. Lord, thank you for each new day, for the breath that you fill our lungs with, for the warmth of our homes, running water, and the abundance of food. We give thanks for readily available transportation, for the convenience of technology, for the sun, moon, and stars that you've set in place. Thank you, Lord God, for the luxury of the freedoms we experience in this country, not the least of which is our freedom to worship you, the one true God. We are thankful for Beulah's church leadership and the ministries in which we have the opportunity to grow and share in your love. And above all else, Lord God, we give thanks for the greatest gift of all, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for whom we experience infinite grace and mercy. Lord God, with so much to be thankful for, there is much that we lift to you in prayer. We ask as a congregation that your hand would continue to guide our direction, make clear the paths in which we should travel, and close the doors where you would have us to redirect. We pray for unity and peace worldwide in our nation, throughout our cities, neighborhoods, families, homes, and in our church. We lift to you the weighty burdens that are amplified during the upcoming blessed holiday season. Let your love and peace be recognized by and provide comfort to those who struggle with loneliness, homelessness, addiction, financial struggles, family conflict, and health concerns for themselves and loved ones. Lord, we lift to you the prayer families and the homebound family of the week and ask that you would make your presence known to them. We pray for Gwen Moss and Rose Kunkel Rorty, and we pray for Ed and Carolyn Palmer who are homebound. We raise all these praises and prayers to you through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory for us. Amen. Let us give glory to God. 
by giving our tithes and offerings. Friends, go now in the power and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that you are loved, you are chosen, you are called, you are sent, and you reign with him in the heavenly places. I bless you as you go, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Somebody, someone. 